ddiogel ei sefydlog Senedd Cymru yn gyfystyr y Thrafodion, y Senedd a Dibenion Dedd Llywodraeth Cymru 2006. Bydd rhai o ddarbyriaeth y rheol sefydlog 34 yn gymwys ar gyfer y cyfarfod yma heddi y mae'r heini wedi nodi ar y chagenda chi. Rhysiad goffa aelod e hefyd fod y rheol y sefydlog sy'n ymwneud â threfn yn y cyfarfod llawn yn berthnasol i'r cyfarfod yma. Yr eitem gyntaf yn y genda ni y prynawn yma yw'r cwestiynau i'r prif weinidog ac mae'r cwestiwn cyntaf gan Siwsi Davis. Uh, prynawn da. Uh, what criteria will the Welsh Government be using to decide when outdoor visitor attractions will be able to reopen? I want to thank uh, Siwsi Davis for that question. The criteria for reopening outdoor visitor attractions are set out in the Welsh Government's Coronavirus Control Plan Alert Levels in Wales. We are currently at alert level four and outdoor attractions are listed as reopening at alert level two. Uh, well, thank you for that answer. Obviously, the sector understands the need to reopen safely, but this is the time of year when they have to make significant spending decisions. And to that end, they're seeking as much information as possible to help them know how long they have, they have to plan to stay closed as opposed to open. Uh, I think the prospect of a safe May election has given them some hope that May might be a possibility. Uh, their immediate concerns, apart from workforce planning, though, are the arrival of rate spills and the possibility of travel being permitted elsewhere in the UK, but not in Wales. And of course, that will affect people's holiday decisions. So what prospect is there of Welsh Government introducing a further business rates holiday for the sector pending reopening? And how important do you think, for the reason I've given nothing to do with devolution, that some attempt must be made to uh, align the reopening dates across the UK, notwithstanding the different tiers or alert levels, um, certainly between England and Wales. Well, I thank uh, Susie Davis for those further questions. And in case I don't have a further opportunity to say it, shall I say to her, uh, she will be much missed uh, in this chamber. Uh, and uh, her question today is, uh, typically constructive in uh, wishing to find answers for a sector which has had a torrid time during coronavirus. Uh, if the Welsh Government receives money uh, in the Chancellor's statement in March that funds us to offer a further business rate relief period in the next financial year, then we will definitely look uh, to do that. But our ability to do it the scale of funding that is required means that can only be done if that is a genuine across UK uh, effort. As far as coordinating dates for reopening are concerned, uh, I hear what the member has said. I'm pleased to say that we now have regular uh, meetings with the UK government uh, every Wednesday and uh, a number of days in between, most weeks now. Uh, where we are able to talk about common approaches to things that happen in all parts of the United Kingdom. We will all nonetheless be calibrating the decisions that we make in the circumstances that we face. As Susie Davis will know, the number of people falling ill with coronavirus per 100,000 of the population in Wales is falling at the moment every day. It's about half the level. Uh, that is to be seen across the border uh, in England. I wouldn't want to deny uh, Welsh businesses or outdoor attractions the chance of opening earlier if our circumstances allowed that to happen. But the situation, Chloe, as members will know, is highly uncertain. Everyone here would have seen the news overnight about the South African uh, variant and developments uh, in England. At the moment, in Wales, we are progressing in a positive direction. All of us are vulnerable to that changing, and that would inevitably have an impact on our ability to reopen parts of the economy. Caroline Jones. Diolch Llywydd. Um, First Minister, whilst nobody would advocate opening up attractions before it is safe to do so, um, we also have to accept that the industry has taken massive proportions to make their businesses as secure as they can with regard to COVID. And what the industry really needs is a clear pathway to opening back up. 
So first minister, can you publish guidelines for the re reopening of the visitor economy um, where it can be contingent perhaps on case rates continuing to fall, but we do need a timeline so that the industry can prepare. Diolch. Uh, sorry, uh, thank Caroline Jones. I understand the points that she makes, uh, of course. The pathway to reopening is the pathway set out in the coronavirus control plan, and that does include a series of indicators, uh, including positivity rates and prevalence rates in the community that tell us when it would be safe to allow outdoor visitor attractions to reopen again. I accept everything that the member said about the efforts the industry itself has made to put itself in a position where people will be confident to visit those attractions again. I honestly don't think there is anything more certain that I could offer that industry or any other, other than to point to the plan that we set out with its alert levels and with the criteria that will allow us to move between them, always pointing to the inherent uncertainty of the circumstances in which we continue to live. Question Dai, Alan Davis. Thank you very much. Will the First Minister make a statement on the UK government's proposals for the Shared Prosperity Fund? So the UK government's proposals for the Shared Prosperity Fund fail to honour repeated commitments that Wales would be no worse off as a result of leaving the European Union and have grave implications for our devolution settlement. I'm grateful to the First Minister for that. Uh, he will have seen uh, the reports and analysis that have been published over the last few weeks, all of which have demonstrated clearly that communities such as Blind Lake Went and the Heads of the Valleys are likely to suffer a much worse economic impact as a consequence of the coronavirus than many other communities. These communities will therefore require additional investment to help us recover. I agree with, with him that the Shared Prosperity Fund is currently proposed is a real betrayal of all those people, not only who voted for Brexit, believing that the EU structural funds will be replaced by UK funding, but also those people who believe that the United Kingdom government had our best interests at heart. The UK government seemed determined to repeat the mistakes of the past and not learn the lessons for the future. In this way, Blaine Gwent is being shortchanged and will crave a price of Tory dishonesty and Tory incompetence. First Minister, do you agree with me that places like Blinequent, communities in the valleys and the heads of the valleys, require additional investment to help us recover from the economic impacts of uh, coronavirus and to create the jobs that we all want to see and need? Well, I thank uh, Alan Davis for that. So uh, he's right to point to the reports that have been published recently. I was able to read uh, at the weekend the Sheffield Hallam University's report on the impact of the coronavirus crisis on older industrial Britain, dealing exactly with uh, areas such as the one that uh, Alan Davis represents here uh, in the Senate. And it does indeed demonstrate the vital importance of continued investment in those communities of the sort that we have been able to draw down during the period when Wales has been able to deploy uh, the funds that have come to us through the European Union. Uh, now we see that being put into reverse. We get £375 million pounds a year in structural funds and as the member will know, you can see the impact of those funds in so many aspects uh, of uh, the infrastructure of the Blaine Gwent constituency. The Welsh Affairs Select Committee, chaired by a Conservative uh, member uh, back in uh, last year, described the Shared Prosperity Fund as having made negligible progress, no clarity as to what it will look like, how it will be administered, nor how it will be funded. And when the UK government responded to the Welsh Affairs Committee's uh, report, the same Conservative uh, chair said, uh, there are still major questions left unanswered, still no certainty on the size of the fund, the method of distribution, the share of the fund, uh, for Wales compared to EU funding and what role, if any, devolved governments can be expected to play in the fund's uh, operation. We do not consider this matter to be closed, 
the chair of the committee said, and I'm quite sure that this Senate doesn't regard it as closed either. Nick Ramsey. Uh, Dioch Llawydd and uh, First Minister, uh, as you've just said, uh, the uh, the chair uh, of the uh, Welsh Affairs <coughs> of the committee, I should say, in uh, in Westminster, has expressed concerns, and I think we all appreciate that there have been issues with the rollout, the development of the Shared Prosperity Fund. However, according to the UK government response to the Welsh Affairs Select Committee report, Wales and the Shared Prosperity Fund in December, the fund will at least match the current EU structural fund receipts with the intention of targeting places most in need, those mentioned by Alan Davis, such as ex-industrial areas, deprived towns, rural and coastal communities. So I appreciate that's the UK government position, may not be the Welsh government's position, but how is the Welsh government planning so that these areas of Wales do indeed ultimately benefit? And how are Welsh government officials working with or at least liaising with the UK government to make sure that when uh, funding does uh, get up and running, those areas will be delivered for? Well, sorry, I, I just don't uh, agree that it's a matter of a difference of opinion. Uh, it is a difference of straightforward fact. Wales gets £375 million a year uh, in the last round of European funding. The Shared Prosperity Fund next year will have £220 million in it for the whole of the United Kingdom. That is not a difference of opinion. Uh, that is a difference of... 150 million pounds. Uh, but uh, if Wales we'll got the whole of the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, we would be 150 million pounds worse off uh, than we would otherwise uh, have been. And that's why when Alan Davis asked his supplementary question, he said, this is a betrayal of everything the people in Wales were told would happen after we left the European Union. Uh, and I'm afraid there isn't a great deal of engagement at official level, because every time we ask the question, uh, we are simply told that there are no further details that can be shared with us. Uh, and that's the same answer we've had now since 2017, when this idea was first suggested by the UK government. 2017 to 2021, in which there are no further details that can be shared with us. Uh, little surprise that not just the Welsh government, but those communities who depend upon this investment to create the sort of economic futures that we need for them, have lost patience uh, and confidence in what this UK government is likely to deliver. Helen Mary Jones. Diolch Llywydd, given how Wales has, has fared uh, in, for many decades through the Thatcher years in the 1980s, 15 years of a Westminster Labour government that didn't reform the Barnet formula, leaving Wales worse off, 11 years of Tory-led austerity, and now the disgrace that is the Shared Prosperity Fund, and I would associate myself with what the First Minister has said about that. Does the First Minister now accept that it is decades since the redistributive potential of the United Kingdom, to which he often refers, has come anywhere near to being fulfilled? And does he now agree with me that it's time for us here in Wales to look after ourselves and each other using the economic levers available to an independent nation to rebuild our economy and end poverty? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, sorry, there's a member uh, knows. And uh, she's very unfair in her characterization of the last Labour government. Uh, during the last Labour government, the cash available to the National Assembly grew by 10% every single year in the first term uh, of this uh, institution. It grew in real terms in every year that Labour was in power. It is absolutely possible to use the United Kingdom as an engine for redistribution. And the last Labour government demonstrated that year in and year out. The temporary failure of the current occupants uh, of uh, power at Westminster to do that should not be confused for an argument that the system is incapable of delivering what I believe it is capable of doing and which will be in Wales's interests. Christina Norgan, Arwenwyr y Pleidia, Arwenwyr, Arwenydd y Ceidwadwyr Cymreig, Andrew Arty Davis. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. And with your permission, I'd just like to put on the record um, our thoughts and prayers are with the families of the three fishermen who are still classed as missing off the North Wales coast and our gratitude to the search and rescue teams who have been out tirelessly trying to give uh, some comfort to those families in trying to seek out their loved ones. Uh, I'm sure all members' thoughts and prayers are with the families of Alan Minard, Ross Ballantyne and Carl McGrath who are still ripstead as missing off the North Wales coast. First Minister, could you um, tell me this current state of the pandemic? Because in your early uh, response to the question from Susie Davis, you clearly indicated that we have a long way to go before we can declare the pandemic as an end. We had the Office of National Statistics figures out today about deaths in Wales and in particular in North Wales. Uh, each and every one a tragedy and our thoughts are with the families who've lost loved ones. And today we have the assessment on the new mutant strain of the Kent variant. So I think it's important for us to try and understand what your assessment is of the current pandemic and the journey we have to continue on here in Wales. Oh, well, sorry, uh, thank uh, Andrew Ossie Davis for those questions and, of course, associate myself with what he said in opening about the families of those three men who are missing at sea in North Wales. I know there will be people right across Wales who have uh, followed the events in North Wales, including the enormous efforts that have been made to locate the people who are missing and to offer, as Andrew Ossie Davis said, comfort uh, to their families. This must be the most awful time uh, for them. My assessment of the state of the pandemic in Wales uh, is this, uh, that because of the decisions that were taken to put Wales into a level four uh, uh, series of uh, measures before Christmas, we are seeing the benefit of that in the period uh, since the turn of the year. So the number of people suffering from coronavirus is going down every day. It's down below 140 per 100,000 uh, today. The positivity rate is going down uh, every day, down to just above 11% uh, today. The number of people in our hospitals with coronavirus has started to come down. It's not down anything like enough, but the trend is now uh, downwards. And we've seen the first impact of that uh, in our critical care capacity as well. All of those are very important achievements and alongside the mass vaccination uh, programme, give us hope that as we go further into this year, it will be possible to restore some of the freedoms to people in Wales that they have had to manage without over recent weeks. But all of that is based on foundations that can shift at any moment. And the examples that the leader of the opposition pointed to, the Kent variant and developments there, the South African uh, variant, while things are moving in the right direction, there's a fragility about all of that. And we've seen in other parts of the world, including parts of the world very close uh, to us, how a set of promising indicators can turn into a set of very difficult indicators in a matter of just a few short weeks. I'd agree with your assessment, First Minister. There is some light at the end of the tunnel with some of the numbers that are moving in the right direction now, but we still have a very long, long way to go with this pandemic. And it is right that we adhere to the restrictions and we do all we can as we go into the spring. What concerns me greatly is when government ministers make commitments during this pandemic, such as the environment minister made throughout the pandemic on seven occasions in the plenary. Back on the 7th of May last year, when talking about NBZ, she said she would not be bringing them forward while we're in the current pandemic period. On the 16th of September, she said, what I've committed to do is not bring them forward whilst we are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. On seven occasions, she said that she would not bring the NVZ regulations forward for adoption here in Wales. And last week, she issued a statement where she contradicted herself and said she was implementing these NVZ regulations as of the 1st of April. Would you personally intervene, First Minister, remind the Minister of the commitments that she's made to farmers and the rural economy and to the people of Wales by her comments on the floor of the plenary and withhold, withhold introdu introducing these regulations until the pandemic is clearly 
confirmed as being at an end and preparations can be in place to adopt these regulations if it is approved by the Assembly. Oh, well, I won't be doing that, uh, so is. Uh, we have waited uh, before introducing the regulations until, as I set out in my answer to the first question from Andrew Arty Davis, the fact that we are moving into, we hope, more benign uh, times as far as the virus is concerned. And the need to put control on agricultural pollution in Wales is urgent. Three incidents on average every week in each of the last three years. Uh, over 90% of ammonia emissions in Wales are from agriculture. The level of pollution incidents in the agriculture sphere are damaging the reputation of farmers, they are damaging our environment, and they are damaging the ability of that industry in the longer run to trade with other parts of the world, given that the strength of our industry is the quality of the produce that it delivers. Now is the right time to do this, and delay would not be in the interests of the industry. The implementation of the regulations will be done sensitively, they'll be done alongside uh, the industry, but further delay is neither environmentally, economically, uh, or in reputational terms to the advantage of the industry. With respect, First Minister, I'd agree with you that one pollution incident is one too many. And as someone who is involved in the agriculture industry, I want to see an industry that has as clean a bill of health as possible. But I go back to the point that I've said to you and offered you examples where the minister is on the record as saying that these NVZ regulations would not be introduced while the pandemic was in existence. Not once, not twice, but seven times in response to questions in the plenary that I have a direct record here. You talk that when we make a promise, we know in the Labour Party that we have to keep it. I would suggest that when a minister of your government makes such a commitment on the floor of the plenary, that is a promise. And this promise is being broken. There is no dispute about pressing down on pollution incidences and making sure we bear down on the people who break the regulations. But when a minister has made such a commitment and you have made such a statement that when the Labour Party makes a promise, it has to keep it, surely these promises have to be kept and we have to come to the end of the pandemic before these regulations are implemented. Well, sorry, the promise that my party makes is that we will deal with agricultural pollution here uh, in Wales. And we have reached a point where I believe, and the minister believes, that we can put these regulations before the Senate. We can do so confident that we have worked hard with the industry and that when it comes to implementing the regulations, we will do that alongside those many, many farmers in Wales who already comply with regulations, who don't pollute uh, our natural environment and who are let down by those who do. Now, if these were entirely isolated uh, incidents, or even if the incidents were falling, I'd have more sympathy what, with what the member has said. Uh, in fact, we have seen no diminution uh, in the rate of agricultural pollution, and we don't just see one, we see three every single week, week in, week out, year in, year out here in Wales, in a way that damages the industry and damages the environment that belongs to us all. That is why we will bring forward uh, the regulations. That is the spirit in which we will uh, approach it. And we are doing the right thing by the industry and by Wales. Rwyneth Plaid Cymru, Adam Price. Guy and get a tegi a salwande a a tegi bod yn meddwl yn angwyddiannu gyd gyda thaliaeth alaminad Ross Valentine a Carl McGrath a Radek Hanod Anod ma even why argument is given. First Minister, the, the, the Scottish Government is providing uh, £19 million in extra funding to councils to enable them to freeze uh, council tax uh, next year, offsetting what 
uh, would have been an average uh, 3% increase. It would cost around 100 million uh, to allow Welsh, Council, uh, Welsh councils to freeze council tax next year uh, and offset uh, the average 4.8% uh, rise that we saw last year. Um, at the time, this time of great financial uncertainty, um, are, are you attracted by the argument um, following Scotland's lead uh, in at the same time protecting vital local services, but also protecting uh, family budgets at such a difficult time? And would you be in a better position to do so um, if you were able to convince Westminster to allow greater flexibility uh, in uh, carrying unspent money forward to next year? Uh, well, so if, uh, I, of course, I see the attraction uh, of what has been proposed uh, for Scotland, uh, but it's £100 million, as the member uh, has mentioned. Uh, you know, week after week, he puts to me propositions for spending that costs uh, tens or hundreds or uh, of millions of pounds. What we have in Wales is the council tax uh, benefit uh, scheme, a unique scheme uh, in Wales, uh, in which we topped up as a Welsh government the £220 million pounds that we were provided with by the Westminster government when, against our wishes, uh, devolution of council tax benefit was uh, carried out. We've added fresh government money to that this year, another £5.4 million, pounds, I think, uh, to make sure that that scheme can go on being uh, operated. Over 300,000 families in Wales benefit uh, from it. The vast bulk of them paying no council tax uh, at all. Uh, that is a way, I think, of protecting those people uh, who most need protection uh, against rising bills at times uh, of restraint, while requiring others of us to make a contribution that we can better make to sustain public services here uh, in Wales. So uh, we have our own way of doing it, and I think it has many advantages. Uh, as to uh, Mr Price's final point, well, I do agree with him there. We have asked the UK government, as has the government in Scotland and the Northern Ireland Executive, for simple flexibilities to allow us to manage end of year expenditure in this extraordinary time. Uh, sadly, we don't appear to be gaining any traction with them. Obviously, the, 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 um, the addition of 5.5 billion uh, to uh, increase to the council tax reduction scheme that you referred to, First Minister, is welcome, but it, 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 it's lower than the increase in, in council tax arrears, and, and people most likely to have gone into arrears are, are those affected by coronavirus, um, households with children, people with uh, disabilities. Now, you know, freezing council tax uh, is uh, is a short term uh, measure, though I'm sure it would be very welcome to many of those uh, families. But the longer term solution is to reform what the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, has called an out of date, regressive and distortionary council tax system. Uh, why have you allowed this unfair system to persist for so long? Well, I agree that the system needs reform. Uh, so is the report that member quotes, is part of the research that this government has commissioned into the current system and to give us proposals as to how it might be reformed. There are very important choices and challenging choices for uh, anybody who wishes to bring about reform in the current system to grapple with uh, whether, uh, and this is what the IFS report is primarily about, uh, we should take some radical action to make the current system of council tax uh, fairer and more progressive, uh, including a rebanding exercise, uh, or whether it is better to think of a different system altogether. And very significant work has gone on over the last few years through the Welsh Government to look at whether land value taxation uh, would offer a better model altogether, even than a reform council tax system drawing on the work of the IFS. So, uh, this government has been on the case of reform here throughout this Senate term, making sure that there are practical proposals that can be implemented uh, if a mandate for that is secured at the forthcoming Senate elections. 
Well, you and I have talked about this uh, this very issue before, but I, I, the question is, of course, what are we going to do now? What we would do in government is to uh, undertake a, 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 to revalue uh, more regularly and ensure that uh, the council tax system is more proportional to the value of properties. We know in Blaine Egwen, for example, um, we've seen value of properties uh, increase more than twice as much compared to to, um, to Wrexham, and properties are increasingly um, arbitrary uh, in terms of the difference in, in, in taxation. And we expect our proposals, under our proposals, 20% of households in the, the bottom fifth of income distribution will see their council tax fall by more than £200. Uh, and uh, the IFS report that you referred to shows that that would mean an average bill falling in somewhere like with a tidville of £160. That's the medium-term solution. The longer-term answer, as you say, absolutely, is to replace them with, with an entirely fairer system related to land value. Uh, First Minister, where are you in terms of the medium and the long-term vision? Well, thanks, the member, for that question. I look forward to going on uh, discussing these matters with him because they are, you know, they are genuinely serious and they're, they're genuinely challenging in a policy uh, sense. Uh, I am attracted not just to regular revaluation, but rolling revaluation, uh, in which it will be possible to have a register that is kept up to date uh, all the time, so you don't get the distortions that we see when revaluations are postponed over many years. That will require a different relationship with the uh, valuation agency, uh, and quite possibly a separate uh, valuation system for Wales, where we're not reliant on the current arrangements. Uh, the member quotes the figures from the uh, IFS report about what revaluation and other reforms might mean for people at the bottom end of the income scale. He doesn't uh, quote the fact that for people at the top end uh, of the property valuation, that could mean thousands of pounds in additional bills every year. Uh, and not everybody who lives in a big house, as he knows, is somebody with a big income. Uh, so they will be a, they will be in need for very considerable transition arrangements to be put in place in order to protect those who would be adversely affected and don't have incomes to fall back on, albeit that they are asset rich, they're not they're cash poor. So it is it will be more complicated uh, than headlines that say that. Some parts of Wales will be better off uh, because the system will have to be navigated through in a way that is fair to everybody. Uh, and it will not be as simple, I'm afraid, as some of the slogans will suggest. Question three, Sheer Griffith. So with Anne for Creveny Dog at Ganyad, are them the your Uncle Gabriel Pablo Geth or Sai either on your deck as it could or say? Uh, Dear Mald, uh, so is Amcan Estinia di Poblo Gaith, Eu Ino Amriwiath, or Vata Sinkail Adevnadio, Bel Sail Ir Formula, Setliad Lodreth Leol. A prefactor sin Lluio Guariant Gwasanaith, Eu Levelai Poblo Gaith, Levelai Amviv Adev, A Thruch Poblo Gaith. Well, Marsh Order Cymru, of course, now we've got the Secliad or, or Dai Pwyn Tri Acanti i Gyngor Exa, mae'r ail Secliad Isa yng Nghymru, a felwch chi'n dweud nawr, ma hwnnw, of course, yn rhannol seliedig ar uh, asesiadau newydd o boblogaeth y sir. Nawr, os ydy'r asesiadau newydd yma yn gywir, se bod boblogaeth y sir yn statig, yn y trach na'n codi'n sylweddol, pan fod adran gynllunio y llywodraeth chi yn mynnu bod y cynllun datblygu lleol yn Rexa, mae'n gorfod delio a chynnydd sylweddol yn y boblogaeth. Mae yna angosondeb difrifol fy hyn ar amser, wrth gwrs, pa bod angen cysondeb a chwarae teg er mwyn i gynghorau allu cynllunio uh, at y dyfodol. Felly, felly allwch chi ddweud hynny prif wneud o pa adran o'ch llywodraeth chi sy'n gywir fy hyn. Yr adran sy'n dweud am Rexham fod y boblogaeth yno yn statig, neu'r adran sy'n dweud fod y boblogaeth yno'n cynyddu'n sylweddol. Well, uh, Llawydd, I think the member is mixing up two uh, different sorts of calculations for two different purposes, derived in two different ways. The way that the local government settlement is brought about is the way that I described in my first answer. There is a formula. The formula is agreed with local government here in Wales. The formula is independently verified by the distribution subgroup, which has 
prominent academics on it who certify every year that the formula has been fairly and accurately applied. Every year, there are local authorities that find themselves gaming because of the way in which uh, factors within the formula move, and there will be local authorities uh, that find themselves not gaining in the way that they uh, would want. Uh, but while the formula remains as it is, and as I've always said in the times that I've been responsible for it, if there are proposals that local authorities in Wales can agree on that they wish to bring forward that would allow the, uh, the formula to be reformed, then of course the Welsh Government will engage in this. But while the formula has the support, as it does, of the Welsh Local Government Association, and while it is based on objective data, independently verified, then we all have to learn to live with it in the years that it suits us and the years when it doesn't. Mark Ashwood. Uh, yeah. uh, well, because the formula has such wide anomalies, it needs a government to take leadership because you can never have agreement between winners and losers within the WLGA. Under your Welsh Government's provisional local government settlement, North Wales councils are again losing out with an average 3.4% increase compared to 4.17% in South Wales and 5.6% for top place Newport, and as we heard, Wrexham receiving just 2.3%. However, Conwy, which again receives a below average increase, is the highest proportion of its population in the oldest age group of all Welsh counties, with Anglesey also receiving a below average increase, not far behind in third position out of 22, and every North Wales county having a higher proportion of its population in the oldest age group than Newport, second from bottom, and Cardiff, bottom. How can your formula justify this, despite the weekly statements and protestations in this Senev highlighting the rights and needs of older people and the need to meet and fund these? Well, so as the member well knows, this is not the Welsh Government's formula, this is the formula that is agreed with local it's government in Wales. Formula. And I hear what he says, uh, and actually he is very disrespectful of local government uh, when he claims that it's impossible for them to do a job uh, in this area, so somebody else must take it away from them. Uh, we every year sit down with a distribution subgroup, the body of experts that gives us advice, that goes to a group of politicians, the finance subgroup on which local authorities are represented from North Wales, as well as everywhere else. The Welsh Government responds to the recommendations uh, of that group. When I was uh, the Minister for Local Government and Finance, uh, shall we, in 2017-18, I remember sitting in that finance subgroup when a report on reform of the personal social services data was discussed. That reform had the effect over two years of moving money away from urban South Wales to rural areas in Midwest and North Wales. That was recommended by the distribution subgroup. And despite the fact that most members of the finance subgroup would see their own local authorities lose out, it was agreed by that group as well. That's the nature of the formula. You update it, you update it objectively, you use the best data you can, and you implement it. And you implement it in a way that does not look to see uh, where the implementation lands geographically. You look to make sure that it is fair, objective, defensible, right across Wales. Question Pedwar Jenny Rathbone. Government strategy for tackling food insecurity in Cardiff. I shall thank the member. The Welsh Government strategy is to support innovation in both the statutory and third sectors in Cardiff, and then to work with successful initiatives which demonstrate the potential to help tackle food insecurity on a wider scale. Uh, thank you, First Minister, for that answer. We've all seen the photos of cut up carrots and peppers, which were supposed to be sufficient for making five lunches uh, to free school meal families in England. And it's, I'm sure you would share my shock that private companies have been permitted to charge £30 for such utterly inadequate food parcels. 
In contrast, all free or school meals, uh, children in Cardiff have the security of vouchers to the value of nearly £20, which they can spend in the local supermarket of their choice. The pandemic has unfortunately exposed how poor diet translates into poor health and makes disadvantaged families so much more likely to catch and die of COVID than families who can afford nourishing food. And that situation is not helped by the disruption to everyday foods imported from the EU. The, the Green Recovery Action Plan devised by Sir David Henshaw and others has some excellent ideas for tackling our food insecure food system, including urban agriculture where it's most needed, increasing the number of people who know how to grow food and connecting growers with local markets. But having spoken to the head of the Trussell Trust in Wales, it's unclear whether this will be sufficient to stem the rise and rise of families needing to turn to food banks in these incredibly difficult times. What role can the Welsh Government play, either through its own procurement policies or other strategies to tackle the food insecurity and poor diet which coronavirus has exposed as such a major contributor to chronic ill health and vulnerability to disease? Well, sorry, I thank Jenny Rathbun uh, for those follow-up questions. I'm afraid I'm old enough to remember when during the Thatcher era, uh, the Conservative-controlled Shropshire County Council served potted meat sandwiches uh, to its free school meals children for Christmas dinner uh, one year. Uh, so it's no surprise to me at all uh, to find that when a public service delivers uh, something for uh, children in need, then they get a better deal than when this is hived off to profit making friends of the Conservative Party. Uh, I agree with uh, the member about the Henshaw uh, report. I'm very grateful to all those who contributed uh, to it. I was able to meet the group early on uh, in their work, and it does provide us with uh, some very practical ideas of how we can make sure that as we recover from coronavirus, we're able to do so uh, in a way that puts uh, our environment and the place that food uh, has in that at the top of our agenda. Uh, shall we remember, uh, ask for some examples of what the Welsh Government is able to do. And here are very quickly are just uh, a small number. Uh, as I said, what we try and do is invest in ideas and then make those ideas go further when they turn out to be good ones. Uh, in my own constituency, Chloe, the Dusty Forge project, a fantastic uh, project, hosted the first pantry uh, scheme in Wales. Uh, that's now gone to other parts of Wales, including, uh, I know, at Glenwood Church in the member's own uh, constituency. Just before Christmas, my colleague uh, Lee Waters announced £100,000 to take into Valley communities the big box buoyed scheme uh, which had started in the Vale of Glamorgan, had been successfully demonstrated in two schools, pioneer schools in Barry, and will now be available to five schools in Merthyr, Aberdeer, Maesteg, uh, and uh, Redama. And maybe in a final example, uh, shall we, on a slightly bigger scale, well, Carmarthenshire County Council, in a partnership with its local health board, its local university, using money through the Foundational Economy Challenge Fund, uh, is finding ways in which the public sector procurement of local food can both provide better food in hospitals, in colleges, in uh, older people's homes, but will secure supply, strengthen local economies, reduce the carbon footprint, and working with the Centre for Local Economic Strategies, we are also looking to take those ideas and to implant them in other local areas in Wales. David Melding. Um, first, this is a very important area, and I, I've been very impressed with uh, food cooperative, cooperatives that uh, establish food clubs where by members for a uh, modest fee uh, get access to a wide range of fresh fruit and vegetables, but also then given uh, um, the chance to improve their cooking skills if uh, that is required. And indeed, when the pandemic is over and we can meet socially again, I can meet. Uh, to uh, um, share their experiences and, and prepare food together, uh, uh, skills then that obviously they take to their households. And these sort of innovations, I think, uh, 
uh, have a lot to recommend them because I think there's a natural desire to eat well and, uh, uh, and cooking uh, when you have the skills, you know, it's not the chore that uh, it, it, it can uh, present itself if you really don't know how to, uh, um, you know, tackle uh, um, a lot of the food substances that are available. Well, so I think Jimmy Miller makes a very important point about the natural human instinct uh, is to share food and to use the sharing of food as the basis for that sort of social interaction. I'm sure I'm not the only member of the Senate who ate a virtual Christmas dinner uh, this year with family members far away uh, in Wales. And great as it is to, to see people, even in that way, it's no substitute for what David Melding talked about, about people getting around the table together and sharing uh, a meal. But I think the, his first example, what he talked about in relation to food cooperatives is very important. The pantry scheme that I referred to answering Jenny Rathbone is, is just an example of that. Everybody pays five pounds into the scheme and then is able to draw food out of a collective uh, stock. And while food banks do a fantastic uh, job, sad as it is to require that job to be done. What the pantry scheme does is to get over that sense that people who use food banks have of being dependent on them, uh, of being in that sort of client relationship. With a pantry, you are a member, as you are in a co-op, and you've paid in, and you take out of it by right. And that changes the whole uh, dynamic, and more developments of that sort uh, would have benefits of the sort that David Melding uh, referred to, but they have wider benefits as well in giving people that sense of social worth and dignity, uh, which we, I know, would both wish to see. Question Pimple and Needle. What assessment has the First Minister made of the impact of Brexit on young people in Wales? Uh, thanks, the member, for that question, shall we? Thanks for the fantastic uh, um, do beg your pardon, sorry, I'm turning over too many pages here. Uh, uh, it's shameful that our young people will be excluded from the Erasmus programme, the largest international exchange programme in history, will no longer be able to live and work easily in the EU27, and will suffer from the economic fallout of the UK government's approach to Brexit. Thank you, First Minister. And as you know, I've spoken before in the Senate about how, as a young person from a deprived community who'd never even had a foreign holiday before, I was able to study at the University of Paris thanks to funding and support from the Erasmus programme. There seems to be little doubt the Turing programme will be a very inferior successor and there are real fears that thanks to the UK government's spiteful, self-defeating and totally unnecessary decision to withdraw from Erasmus+, Plus, many young people in Wales will lose out, especially those who are most disadvantaged. Now there has been some speculation that a way can be found to enable young people in Wales and Scotland to continue to participate in Erasmus, which is something I hope wholeheartedly welcome. Can the First Minister update Senev on any discussions in this regard? And can he assure me that he will pursue every possible avenue to enable Welsh young people to continue to participate in this life-changing scheme? I would entirely agree with uh, Lynn Needle. It is a life-changing experience to go abroad, to work, to study, to meet other uh, young people with different experiences. Uh, and it, it is one of the most awful decisions of this UK government to, uh, to deny those opportunities uh, to young people, not just in Wales, but across the rest uh, of the UK. Uh, the Minister for Education received uh, a letter on the, 20, on the 19th of January from the Secretary of State for Universities in the UK government. Uh, this is what the letter said. You raise the possibility of Wales joining Erasmus Plus as an independent uh, participant. You do not have the competence to enter into any such agreement. So not only are they determined to deny uh, opportunities by their own actions, but they seek to frustrate uh, the efforts that we would make, and we'd certainly make them alongside the Scottish government if that was 
uh, possible to find other ways in which those opportunities could be made uh, available. That is not to say, Chloe, for a moment that we do not go on thinking of every way in which we can find opportunities for those young people. Uh, I met the German ambassador uh, recently. It was a very positive meeting in which he talked about bilateral possibilities for exchanges between young people here and young people uh, in Germany. I discussed the whole Erasmus business with the foreign minister of the Republic of Ireland uh, recently, again looking to see whether there are any avenues that we might be able to explore uh, there. We want young people from Wales to be able to visit, to work, to study, to get all the advantages that Lynn Needle uh, pointed to, and we want young people from other parts of the world to come here to Wales as well. A possibility completely ruled out uh, in the Turing uh, scheme. Uh, at the weekend, uh, so I gave myself a small treat and listened for half an hour to the World Service. Uh, it was an interview with a very distinguished epidemiologist leading a team at London University. Uh, and during the interview, uh, the interviewer asked him, how did you come to work uh, in London? Uh, and he said, well, I was brought up in Germany. I went to Belfast on a Erasmus scheme, and I've stayed here ever since. That's what we are turning our back on by the small-minded approach of this UK government to what has been one of the jewels uh, of the European Union. Question where heaven, David. Will the First Minister provide an update of the uh, delivery of the COVID-19 vaccine in Philly? Well, so is, there have been fantastic uh, efforts by all those uh, involved in delivering the vaccination programme here uh, in Wales at a rapid and an accelerating pace. In the Anirin Bevan University Health Board, 72 GP practices are participating in the programme right across the board's area, including all the GP surgeries in Caerphilly, County Borough. I agree. I think the Anirin Bevan Health Board has pulled out all the stops. It's been absolutely incredible to see a vaccine programme uh, start from absolute scratch to what they're producing at the moment, which is 77% of 80-year-olds have been vaccinated. That's probably gone up uh, since the session started today. Uh, the concern a few residents have been in touch with has been uh, with regard to queuing outside the centres. And one problem is, is that those people have to cast, catch buses from areas like St. Enid, Abertidu and Nelson uh, will find that they have no choice but to arrive early because that's how the buses work. I've been in touch with Caerphilly Council, who ha are looking into community transport uh, to try and deliver a, a better transport service directly to the centre for people. Uh, Caerphilly Council have got back to me and said they are investigating those options and would like to run it also on a regional basis. Um, can the First Minister, uh, in recognising the huge progress that's made, also uh, give some support to uh, community transport provision to uh, mass vaccination centres? Uh, sorry, I thank uh, Heavy David for that follow-up. Question. He's absolutely right about what has been achieved uh, in Caerphilly. Over 7,000 people over the age of 80 already vaccinated uh, in the borough. And somebody is vaccinated every five seconds here uh, in Wales. So I'm quite certain by the time this question is over, somebody in Caerphilly will have been vaccinated uh, as part uh, of that programme. And I think it tells us something, uh, shall we, that we're now at that stage in the programme where we are able to focus on not just the huge infrastructure uh, effort that's been made in securing all the mass vaccination centres, but over 400 uh, GPs participating in the mobile uh, units that are out there vaccinating as well. But we're able now to focus on a practical detail of the sort that Evan David has highlighted this afternoon. Of course, uh, we don't want to see elderly people particularly having to queue outside in the January and February uh, weather and making sure that there are transport opportunities for people who can't rely on their own cars when we ask them to go uh, to a particular location to get vaccination. Uh, those are the sort of details we're now able to uh, grapple with. And in the work that uh, is led by my colleague Vaughan Geffen, uh, and I join him every week in a meeting with a top team responsible for vaccination across Wales, we will make sure that we take up the issues that the member has raised uh, today so that we can assist the efforts 
of Caerphilly County Borough Council in making sure that the programme goes on being the outstanding success it is today. Question Scythe, who are Anka Davis? Yeah, Clement. Will the First Minister provide an update on support for European Union citizens living in Wales? I thought the Welsh Government continues to fund services which provide advice and assistance to EU citizens in Wales. This includes support with making applications for settled status and other general and specialist advice, covering a wide range of issues from social welfare benefits to employment and workplace matters. Thank you for that answer, First Minister. And as you know, Wales is home and has been for some time to people from right across the EU. They've established their families here, brought their families up. They've rooted themselves in our culture in Wales. And I have to say, I've enriched it with theirs as well. Many of them have worked throughout this pandemic to keep our key services running. And yet, and yet, we know that there are still too many who've not yet applied for settled status. So with a slightly worrying development last week that the UK government is offering bizarrely financial incentives to EU citizens to leave the UK. Will you ensure that we are doing all that we can in Wales and all you can as a Welsh government to ensure that EU citizens living here are aware of their rights, aware of how to secure settled status, and crucially are told clearly that this is their home and they are very, very welcome here? Well, Thawid, I completely agree with you, Aranka Davis. It has surely been one of our great success stories that we have persuaded people from other parts of the world to come and make their future part of our future here in Wales. Uh, and they bring with them, as Hiranka Davis said, not simply the skills that they bring and the economic opportunities that they help us to create, but they bring that cultural richness that comes from having people from other parts uh, of the world part of uh, Welsh society and Welsh communities. Uh, and it is a mixed message, to put it at its politest, that the UK government, while on the one hand claiming to encourage EU nationals to stay here in Wales, quietly slips out the fact uh, that those people are now to be treated within the UK government's voluntary return scheme. Well, we can have it both ways. I mean, either we are all working hard to encourage them to stay, uh, or we're putting in arrangements to help them to leave. Uh, and here in Wales, we want to encourage them to stay for all the reasons that Hugh Aranka Davis has said. It's why we have put two million pounds of Welsh government money into specialist advice to help people with st settled status applications. It's why we've extended the contract with the Citizens Advice Bureau to the end of June to make sure that they're there right up to the last minute helping people with uh, what they need. And, you know, my view is, is that the date by which settled status can be applied for should be extended beyond the 30th of June. What we are learning is, is that in the coronavirus context, people who have language uh, challenges, trying to do it remotely, trying to do it over the phone, trying to do it by filling in forms, it is putting barriers in the path of people who want to stay and who we want to stay, but where face-to-face -face advice has been much more difficult to organise. Just more time to allow those people to complete the process in the way the UK government says uh, they would wish to see would be to everybody's uh, benefit. And we continue to make sure that we make that case to the UK government because we want to see those people who make such a positive contribution to Welsh life able to go on doing so. Now, a question with Mandy Jones. Yeah, Llywydd. Will the First Minister outline the Welsh Government's plans for the regeneration of high streets in North Wales? Uh, Llywydd, our Transforming Towns programme in North Wales is focused on supporting the vibrancy of our town centres, making them fit for the 21st century, enabling job creation and improving community facilities. Working closely with local authority partners, Projects worth over £39 million are being delivered over the period between 2018 and 2021. Thank you. 
First Minister, many high street shops have gone and they are unlikely to ever return. The loss of Debenhams and the Arcadia Group brands and the jobs attached to the physical stores is being felt very keenly across North Wales. The pandemic has resulted in a moratorium on business rates, which in turn will result in lowering of tax revenue for local authorities. Is it now time for a radical rethink of a business rates regime that has been seen as a limiting influence on business startups and their substantial substantiability and look at something that reflects modern shopping habits like a small online sales tax? Uh, well, thank the, the member for that contribution. It follows on from the discussion that I was having with Adam Price earlier uh, this afternoon. Uh, a sales tax is another option. Uh, Manny Jones is right that can be considered uh, as part of a repertoire of things that could be introduced to uh, to replace the business rate system uh, alongside the domestic council tax uh, system. Our town centres will need real imagination in the way that they recover from uh, the pandemic. They need to be supported in that by a UK tax regime uh, that takes uh, taxes from those who trade online and who now largely escape that, whereas somebody on the high street has to make their uh, contribution. In the short run, we go on providing our small business rate uh, relief, uh, which provides significant rate relief for a very large number of particularly small businesses here in Wales. There is a longer run programme of reform, both in terms of business uh, rates, but also in the nature of the high street uh, in the future. Uh, and I agree with the member that thinking about that needs to begin now and needs to include as many imaginative ideas as can be brought to the table. Diolchir prif yn eidog. Reit yn nesaf, felly yw'r cwestiynau'r dirbrwy yn eidog, a dwi'n uh, galwyr Vicky Howells i ofyn y cwestiwn cyntaf. Vicky Howells. Diolch, Llawydd. Will the Deputy Minister provide an update on Welsh Government interventions to improve community safety in Cynan Valley? The Welsh Government is committed to ensuring our communities are safe, strong and resilient. We continue to work with our four police forces, local authorities, UK government and other agencies to help ensure our people and our communities remain safe. Thank you, Deputy Minister, and I'd like to extend my thanks to all those who work so hard to keep our communities safe in these very difficult times. During the pandemic, my constituency has experienced a notable increase in antisocial and dangerous behaviour by off-road motorcycles illegally using popular walking paths and other public rights of way. The laudable work of Welsh Government to open up our walking paths and allow fully inclusive use has, with the removal of barriers, made it much easier for off-road motorcycles to use such paths and more difficult for the police to enforce the law and keep residents safe. What discussions have you had with South Wales Police and with the Police and Crime Commissioner about how this intractable problem can best be tackled? Well, thank you very much, Vicky Howells, for that question. An important question about promoting community safety. And, and as you say, thanking all of those in your constituents in the Cannon Valley and across Wales, for ways in which they have worked to ensure there is community safety. But you've raised the issue of off-road biking. Um, I, I, I'm very much aware, and obviously your evidence today shows that there's been an increase in reports of illegal activity during lockdowns. And, and of course that encroaches on all those important open spaces uh, uh, for walking and for taking exercise, which is so crucial for health and well-being. Well, I do understand South Wales Police have planned operations uh, as part of an approach to tackle this issue, because uh, we have strong relationships with our police forces. I will raise the points that uh, the member makes um, and ensure that we look at off-roading as an issue where we can uh, make sure that the, they are not accessing routes that have no uh, vehicle rights or driving in a legal manner, uh, and that this will be an important issue in terms of community safety and well-being. Question die, Jane Bryant. 
What support is the Welsh Government providing to the voluntary sector in Wales? The Welsh Government provides core funding for the Welsh Council for Voluntary Action and County Voluntary Councils to enable them to support local voluntary organisations and volunteering groups across Wales. We've approved 26.5 million with an additional 5.7 million for the voluntary sector. That was just that final um, 5.7 approved this week to support the sector during the pandemic. Uh, thank you, Deputy Minister, for that answer. Voluntary groups and charities do exceptional work to support some of the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, one such group is a Sparkle Appeal, which supports children, young people and their families with disabilities and developmental difficulties at the Serenai Centre in Newport. Their work is crucial. However, they themselves have had an incredibly hard year with COVID restrictions, seeing their work and funding opportunities limited. They greatly appreciated the Welsh Government grant last year, which was aimed at covering six months of core costs. However, nine months in, their financial state is suffering. How are the Welsh Government supporting organisations such as this to ensure that they can continue to support the most vulnerable through this period? Because the work that they do is vital and we can't afford to lose them. Well, thank you, Jane Bryant, for bringing uh, attention to this important charity in your constituency. In fact, inspirational work, as you described, are um, done by charities such uh, like Sparkle and, of course, all their volunteers um, in, in the Gwent area, are particularly helping to support disabled children and young people and their families. So, of course, as you say, Sparkle uh, was a be did benefit from the £90,000 grant from what was our Voluntary Services Emergency Fund uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and we've been ensuring that these sources of support for third sector organisations continue during the pandemic. But it has been an, a, a great challenge for communities and groups of this kind uh, because of uh, the coronavirus outbreak, because so many of them, of course, have uh, ha had to, lost income as well as had additional demands and expectations, and so many volunteers have, have engaged. But I am very pleased that, as I, I said in answer to your first question, that we're making a further £5.7 million available to continue with this work um, through the pandemic. And I hope this will be able to support organisations such as yours. And there's a question for you all. Firstly, question for Edward Delith-Jewel. Will the Deputy Minister make a statement on the role of specialist support services in supporting survivors of domestic violence during the pandemic? Well, I can't thank the specialist services enough for their responses to victims during the pandemic. They've been a crucial lifeline to so many and they've shown resilience, strength and a great ability to adapt. My officials meet with the Valder SV strategic group regularly to discuss the impact on the, se the sector in supporting survivors of domestic violence. But thank you for that answer. Well, as you'll know, of course, the, this crisis and the associated lockdowns have led to an escalation of risk for women who are either in abusive relationships or are fleeing them. But there is an equal crisis looming that is related to the funding of the specialist support services that are literally or, 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 or figuratively then a lifeline for these women. Funds were received later than expected and they are struggling to spend the money before the deadline in March. Organisations like Welsh Women's Aid are calling for flexibility in this spending deadline as it's a particular problem in situations where the funding was earmarked for recruitment. Organisations have had a very short time in which to recruit and train new staff to, to meet the continued demand for services. If that flexibility isn't introduced, Minister, or the funding uh, commit, a funded commitment is made to match that after March, then many staff will be lost. So surely, Minister, no one would want these organisations to have to rebid for money after March, as this could be time and resource far better spent on protecting women. So will the government please address these concerns and consider this urgently? Well, thank you, Delith Jewell, for raising that important question, because we must make sure that this money that's been allocated does actually reach those specialist services, because we uh, the, the sector itself, and as I said, um, my officials and indeed myself, when I can meet with the sector regularly, uh, they've received over £4 million of additional funding this year. 
uh, it's an extra 67% compared with last year. Um, and this is also about uh, ensuring that we're investing in the, the needs of the sector. I mean, particularly, for example, in terms of accommodation, the dispersed community-based accommodation, so capital as well as revenue. Uh, and it, it is important also that the extra revenue funding it does uh, respond to the needs that have been raised with us during the pandemic. I, I of course, will talk to my officials about uh, the, the ways in which we can ensure that that money not only reaches the specialist services, but they, that they can spend it and that there is that flexibility, uh, because it is crucial that the extra money that we've been able to raise in the budget as a result of the pandemic, and indeed through into the draft budget, uh, does reach the, those victims and the women particularly who are, are uh, escaping uh, domestic violence and abuse. And that Valder SV, five years into our uh, Valder SV uh, legislation, pioneering legislation, actually is delivering at the sharp end. Another question, Pim Joyce Watson. Uh, Jill Clowid, uh, will the Deputy Minister provide an update on how the Welsh Government is supporting the voluntary sector during the pandemic? In April last year, I announced £24 million to support the third sector in Wales through the pandemic. Uh, this recognised the vital role the sector plays ha and has played in response to COVID-19. In December, I announced a further £2.5 million to ensure this support continues until the end of March. Um, well, thank you uh, very much uh, uh, for that commitment that is being uh, shown uh, by uh, government, but there's equally the commit commitment that voluntary sector organisations uh, give to their communities, uh, particularly in this uh, time of great need. And what I uh, want to ask you uh, today, uh, Deputy Minister, is whether you would commit to thanking all of those individuals right across Wales the charitable organisations who have given their time during the pandemic and they have supported uh, both individual people and families and communities uh, from uh, east to west and north to south. Well, I'd particularly like to thank Joyce Watts for giving me the opportunity to thank those uh, volunteers, those third sector organisations who've risen to the challenge uh, of the pandemic. Uh, I think everyone here uh, in the Senate in all their constituencies will have seen uh, the results of that in an incredible volunteering response to the pandemic in communities, neighborhoods, um, and also uh, new organizations are developing as well as the existing ones um, and making sure that they can reach out and support uh, those who are coming forward. So I'd like to give my thanks in that way and just in terms of Pembrokeshire uh, in, in your community, to recognise the role of the Pembrokeshire Association of Voluntary Organisations. Uh, they, of course, receive a um, grant from us on, on a regular basis. They, they receive their core funding from us, and also they receive extra funding to respond to the pandemic. Um, can I also just uh, say, um, Claire Howard, that it was, it's been so heartening to see that Pembrokeshire is, is a county of sanctuary. And the response that the volunteers have given as a result of the county of sanct uh, sanctuary um, to uh, the volunteers are given to those uh, who are residing in the Penali camp, I have to say, is extraordinary. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank all those uh, volunteers in Pembrokeshire and ac across Wales, but particularly focusing on those Pembrokeshire volunteers today uh, when we think of the contribution that they're making to make life bearable uh, for the people residing in the Penale camp. Lochir Terpri Winnie Dog, a retemnessavelur that can yad a business. 